John Bell Merrick, and uh, joining me today is Stephen Wong. Um, I will be uh, uh, we'll, we'll be talking to you to you today about um, uh, some ways in which to utilize Kubernetes within the uh, telco networking uh, environment. And uh, a little bit about me: uh, I joined um, the Kubernetes community a little over five years ago. Did a lot of work in uh, SIG network, particularly around Core DNS, and later moved to SIG architecture where um, I've uh, been involved in the conformance subproject as well as in, um, I initiated the production readiness review and I'm a co-chair there in SIG architecture. Stephen? Hi, uh, as John said, I, I, I'm also from Google, but prior to Google, I make my contributions to more of a telco open source community by co-founding the OpenStack Tackle project, which is the VNF managers. Also one of the initial cores for uh, Neutron networking SFC. Uh, network service network, uh, function network training, as well as uh, actually founded uh, the OPNFV uh, Clover project, which is trying to use uh, cloud native open source projects to address uh, telco use cases. Great, so, thank welcome. you, Stephen. Um, and as I said, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, deploying network functions uh, across the entire um, set of uh, compute resources. Uh, from edge to core. So, Stephen, why don't you uh, take it from here? Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So, I, I think it goes without saying that. Uh, so, so the, the context of what we want to do in this particular presentation is more network function centric. So, things about deploying network functions, things about uh, configuring network functions, things about uh, uh, how do you manage network functions in general in a, in a 5G network. Uh, they are complex. Uh, um, they're, they're one of the big reasons, and then it goes without saying. One of the big reasons is because uh, both the three GPP side, uh, they 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 try to separate the control plane from from data plane. So now, the EPC, the five G core, is is fully separated. The the components are spreading all over the place, uh, and also on the ORAN side, uh, they are also doing separations between control plane, user plane, and uh, and data plane. So there, it's no longer a single piece of software. It's it's fully distributed thing, um, and because 5G has so much more bandwidth. You are starting to run many things onto the edge. And then telco is not just a single edge, it's many tiers of edges. Uh, and, and many of those components are spreading over to edges uh, to optimize performance and latency requirements. And, and for that, it adds to a complexity of both managing and uh, deploying and managing uh, those uh, network functions components. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the transition of um, going from uh, virtual network functions to more of a containerized network functions. Uh, one of the big things is uh, manual uh, management and, and, uh, and orchestration uh, from Etsy. Uh, it's basically built on um, IAS clouds, the infrastructure as a service cloud. So the abstractions and everything seems to be managing just those set of hard infrastructures. Uh, but then container, particularly on Kubernetes, are, are, are very different abstractions and concepts. So when you transition from a more manual to VIM, uh, uh, virtual uh, infrastructure management interface, uh, to a more containerized uh, network functions, uh, you start having this current hybrid models that you can see where manual is optimal for managing OpenStack-like things, OpenStack-like IAS abstraction, whereas you know it's, it's kind of a poor fit to, to, to actually uh, start looking at the Kubernetes workloads. Um, so what the, the, the where we're looking at actually moving forward if in 5G network because of the nature of uh, containerized network functions becoming more ubiquitous given that you're running on edge. So the resource kind of constraining you to uh, kind, of, kind of making it more optimal to run uh, containerized network functions is more of a unified cloud native management is what we're looking at in, in a world where you are using basically just one model one management uh, platform and then it can both manage vms and containers in a very very unified manner uh, next slide please so of course given that we're here given that we are we tap the onis is actually part of you know the extension of qcon we're talking about using kubernetes to manage both the virtual the the, the vnf workloads and the cnf work, workloads um and they're but it obviously doesn't work off the box. Uh, Kubernetes is very good at mapping the application needs to the infrastructure. Um, and then now the applications are the network functions. So their, their demands are not the standards, just a single uh, compute and, 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 and infrastructure and, and the simple 
it will open up a port on their network, a flat layer three network, which is what the traditional Kubernetes is. So they they obviously um, one one things that almost require for all the network functions is multiple interfaces. So things on Maltis, uh, SLIOV, which does a kernel bypass, which is actually very tough for containers, uh, and 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 requires you to actually create mapping directly on your network, your your virtual functions. Uh, to interfaces, to a physical interfaces. Uh, all those things need to be kind of integrated uh, into Kubernetes to make it a little easier to spin out existing parts. Um, you are actually looking at the network that is far too far more complicated. Uh, a, 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 a CNF as an application is a lot more demanding on networking and a lot more knowledgeable of the network. So so they're they're not just abstracted network into it, just a connectivity policies and and port numbers uh they're, they they actually would have to physically configure a vlan a vrf uh, uh whatever uh, little things on the network that need to be in place they have that knowledge so all those things are obviously not part of kubernetes today so the idea we have here is extending kubernetes to manage all the things that the network functions actually demand next slide please uh but then if you do it a little knobs and little bits and pieces of the the open stack models open stack neutron models i mean nothing nothing bad about open stack but then the imperative models where you're creating a neutron network create a neutron port uh plug a nova vms into a neutron network through that port is extremely imperative extremely descriptive and then and then in the environment where you're fully distributed uh the entire infrastructure basically hosting a set of abstraction of your of your network functions um that becomes very unscalable and becomes extremely unportable. So the the things that Kubernetes promotes, and and then and then we would like to see, even the network functions we adhere to is more of an intent driven model, where you're saying something like, "Hey, I want to deploy five G networks in this set of clusters, basically, on infrastructure, or in this little diagram. It's basically just telling you, oh, I want to, I want to get something to drink, <laughs> and because I'm thirsty, and then and then you go figure out how to get me something to drink." Um, and then, and then I want a soda, uh, and then, and then, so in in case of saying that I want a coke in you know twelve ounces coke onto this particular cup, please wash it and 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 bring it to me in this room. Uh, that kind of thing is 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 uh, not if you extrapolate that into what a network function's requirement is, it would it would probably it would never really fly uh, because. The environments are, are, are just so much more distributed. They're multi clusters that you have to manage. Um, then, and you basically get into a situations where um, it's very hard to manage, and, and any changes will require a complete change of uh, of your current deployment scripts. Um, next slide, please. So, what do we need is basically cloud management in every single tier. Uh, the, the the concept of Kubernetes, where it's intent driven. It should be done on every single layers. It's not just you know your infrastructure needs, but also the network functions configurations where it can actually be driving the infrastructure. For example, your IP address may have to be applied. Obviously, it needs to be applied on a, a the kernel level so that so that you know what the how to address them. But it also maybe maybe well not maybe for sure it needs to be applied also on the network functions level and the configurations. So on every single level, you want that to be managed in a uniform way. And, and to do that, obviously, for Kubernetes is a well-known way of extending Kubernetes current resources, which is the, uh, the custom resource definitions. Um, and, and part of CLDs, you usually come with now in operators. The operator patterns is now the predominant the patterns to address uh, how to add other CLDs in place. So, so we are, we're looking at a world where you start adding CLDs that are addressing uh, more than just your infrastructure needs or your 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 new um, different types of Kubernetes uh, 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 cloud provider needs, but also you know the domain, the, your RAN, your core, your five G core, your five G RAN, what what is needed, uh, what kind of configuration changes are needed, are now could be expressed in CLDs, and then and then you can use operators to to process those intents, uh, and then those things are going beyond just a node, right? It's, it's going to the entire network. It's going to, um, and it's it's going into across different uh, clusters on different sites, um, and then and then so now you are, you have no out of band configs uh, on the user level, uh, because the operator would be the one actually trying to take that intent, and then talking to uh, 
talking to their own uh, element management or the, if they use GRPC, NetCon for some other things. And, and, and obviously this is way more than a Google only effort. So we, we are doing this presentation one, as a way to start calling for uh, industry uh, um, the people that, are, that, that think the same way to come together and try to make this happen. Next slide, please. And of course, right. this is just that one. Yeah, so, so exactly. So thank you, Stephen. Um, so, um, so now we're at a stage after, after we do everything Stephen just talked about, right, where we have, um, we have at the different tiers along the edge, the remote edge and the sort of uh, tier one, two, whatever we want to call them, all the way up to, say, a hyperscaler region of a, of a cloud provider. Um, we have a consistent control plane, right? That's the unified cloud native um, management piece. And so we're done, right? We just, we, we can now just deploy a network function anywhere. Kubernetes will pick it up. It'll render those, those um, infrastructure changes down below all the way down to the, you know, as deep as we need without any human intervention and we can all just relax. Of course, that's not true. Um, uh, a lot more is needed. Uh, we need to be able to do the things that come before we put the network function at that tier. We need to figure out which tier to put it on. We need to look at the requirements for um, the you know, latency or whatever it may be and um, use that to select the tier. We need to um, figure out once we know we want it say on the, the far edge, um, well, where on the far edge? Because there are thousands and thousands of sites and do we need it everywhere? Do we need it just in certain regions? So um, we need to be able to figure out those locations. Um, okay, so now we've picked the location, we've picked the function, we've picked the tier and we need to specialize the config because that function config is gonna be different for that particular tier and location and other factors um, than it would be anywhere else. Once we've figured out what the config looks like, we need to deliver it there. We need the control plane to get that configuration so that, so that it can act on it. And of course, that doesn't even start to talk about all the monitoring and service assurance and all of the things we need to do to operate that network function and scale that network function and just make sure that the network itself is up and running. So we were given 30 minutes for this talk, so I'm not gonna talk about all of that. And even if I wanted to, I don't have solutions for all of that. But what I will talk a little bit about is config specialization. That one, that one line in there, config specialization. Why do we pick config specialization to talk about? Well, because we believe it's one of the hardest problems in there. Um, all of those other problems are hard too, but this is one of the hardest ones. And the reason is um, that that goes back to what Stephen started with, which is which is complexity. Configurations are really complex. So let's start to break down the problem and make it a little bit less um, onerous. So we'll start with categorizing our configurations into these two broad categories. One we call provisioning config. So this is Kubernetes stuff for the most part when we're talking about a Kubernetes control plane. It's what are these manifests that we use to tell you what container to run how to configure the node, how to configure the cluster, how to configure the underlying um, uh, infrastructure. Um, and uh, this is typically today done with infrastructure as code tools. And um, it, you know, th there's certain best practices out there today in how it's done. The other piece is the networking config. So Steven referenced this a little bit where he talked about um, that the when you change the IP address, you're going to have to let you know the kernel know maybe, but you're also going to have to potentially reconfigure the function. So these are the actual the actual network function configurations that that realize the telco network as opposed to the control plane network and control plane pieces. Today, this was often done with netconf. So you actually talk to the the actual container that comes up, runs uh, you know some service that's listening, and you talk to it with netconf. And, um, and it changes itself internally, or you SSH in to that box and you run some commands, or there's network vendor, uh, vendor specific element managers, vendors here being the network function vendors. They may have element managers that manage their network functions and allow you to configure them in different ways. Okay, so we have these broad two types of configuration, provisioning config and network config. 
Another dimension of this is the day zero, one, and two considerations. So day zero being design, how do I hook all these things together? What do I want? Uh, uh, how, what function talks to what other function? Um, what level of scale do they need, et cetera? Day one being how do I actually provision these? It's kind of more what we're talking about here. And then, and then day two, um, how do I scale it? How do I uh, make changes to it? Um, all of both these types of configs vary based upon all of the things we talked about before, the tier, the location, the specific function, um, probably there's particular use cases and requirements for, for that particular network that we're trying to render. Um, and they change in interrelated ways. You change one, you have to change both, you know, because some requirement changed. So like we said, lots of complexity. Um, can't address it all today. Let's drill into provisioning config and focus on, on one thing. And like Steven said, this is nothing we could possibly do on our own, which is where we're drilling narrower and narrower for this conversation. But as a community, eventually we would hope we all talk about all these things together. Okay, so thinking about provisioning config, like I said, that's typically handled today with infrastructure as code tools. So basically templates. So you, you think about a, a template configuration, it's got some uh, if then else statements in it, it's got some loops in it, 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 it takes in a set of parameters and it uh, renders a set of manifests on the end. So that works in simple cases. It works great in simple cases. It's, it's pretty easy to understand conceptually. Um, if somebody's new to this, they're sort of like, well, I just want to make it slightly different in this environment. And, and that's great. But as you get more and more of these sets of configuration and you get more and more use cases where you want to deploy that same set of configurations, the complexity quickly ramps up. So these become thousands and thousands of lines. When you actually get what you actually get running on the cluster, if there's a problem with it, you have to backtrack somehow to figure out which of all of those parameters, where's the bug in all of those if then else statements that caused this particular value to get delivered to the cluster based upon this particular set of inputs. And it can be really hard to, to, to backtrack that. Um, you, you also, this model lends itself to what we would call black box, um, a black box model. So you think of these sets of configuration as something you don't understand. I don't understand that. You just tell me what parameters are, there are and I'll just tweak these knobs on the outside and you'll, you'll render it. But the reality is we have to support these networks that are running. We have to support these network functions that are running. So we have to understand in the end, all of the stuff that's going on and running in these, in these environments. Not only that, what, what, when we start to treat it as a black box, we, we, and we start to say, but we need to deploy this in these different tiers, in these different sites, for these different customers that have slightly different requirements, then all of a sudden uh, the number of parameters explodes. And so you have to understand now a new API, a sort of shadow API of hundreds or thousands of parameters which have no consistent schema and have no validations and are just, you know, a, a sort of hodgepodge of key value pairs. And that that again, it's just it's just unmanageable from a a debugging and a keeping track and a policy enforcement and consistency point of view. So, okay, we got complexity, complexity. I haven't offered you any solution yet, right? Let's just pause a moment and go back and think really basic computer science. What are machines good at? And what are people good at? People aren't good at handling all those parameters. You know what? Machines are really good at processing data. And one thing we've learned in our industry is that if we want those machines to be even more effective and we want to be able to understand how to tweak the processing of that data, uh, we can impose a little bit of structure on the data. So the, the, the thinking here is, uh, or the examples here that I'd like to think about are files, streams. In Unix, every file is a stream. It's just a stream. And so we've got tools like SED, which I believe stands for stream editor, which can just go through that stream and replace things. Okay, fine. Well, 
let's put a little more structure on it than a stream because a stream is already structured, but let's put a little more structure. Let's put line breaks in there. Now we've got lines. Oh, now we can do a few other simple things. We can count the lines. We can uh, compare the lines and see if they're the same or different and, it, and, and we know how to break it up. Um, we, can, uh, we can come up with tools like awk, which can do all kinds of crazy things on those lines. And actually, then let's take it a step further. Okay, we take those lines and we break them into, we add, we, we go from, from just rows to rows and columns, and now we've got this table structure. Wow, we've come up with SQL, which an entire, you know, billions and billions of dollars are built on top of SQL on this really pretty simple structure of just taking the file and breaking it into, into cells, into tables, uh, rows and columns. And we can create a whole language that can operate on top of those and build repeatable operations on top of those. So, so this is sort of the key insight, looking at this configuration problem and the amount of complexity that we're talking about in this configuration problem and saying, how do we apply sort of basic best practices of computer science, what the best lessons we've learned in computer science? We do it by treating the configuration as data. That means that the data and, and giving that data structure. So in our particular case, that's the Kubernetes resource model. This concept of creating the configuration as data and operating on that structured configuration as data is shockingly called configuration as data. So like I said, basic goal is represent that config with a simple data model. We've, we're choosing YAML and Kubernetes resource model here. Um, that gives us this sort of well-defined schema and KRM is also an extensible schema. Um, and then we start to build tools on top of it. So some of the tools that have been built on this model are kept and customized, both open source tools. Um, and um, once we have that, it, we, we're sort of designed, we're now, we're now working um, with our configurations in a design that's intended to support automation. So we can package up these configurations into packages and um, those, can, those packages can be composed, they can be edited in place. And, and the original author, so if you think about, uh, if you think about Git, those of you who are um, familiar with the basic uh, software engineering practice of source code control, Git is the most popular uh, source code control manager these days. And um, you think about, you write some code, uh, somebody clones that repository, they might change the code. You change your original code, and now you, the, the people can merge that back down in. Now that's done in source code with just basic file merge line by line, right? The structure in question there, as we talked about earlier, was line structure. With um, config as data using a KRM and YAML model, we can actually take that a whole other step higher because we actually understand more than just the line structure. We understand the, um, the field structure of that KRM resource. And we can actually have semantic knowledge. We can say, we know what labels are. Metadata labels, we know what those are. And so if I take this package and I clone it, and I make, I add some labels to it, then um, the original author adds some labels in their package. When I go to merge it, I don't just have to overwrite my changes with what the, the original author now did. I actually know I can merge those things because labels are additive, right? So, so it's a, a, a sort of even higher level of structure and even higher level of automatability than, um, than we get out of, um, you know, sort of the, just, just treating the files as basic um, structured text files. Okay, so um, what does this result in? So, so the idea here is that we, because of the machine processability of this configuration, there's no longer feed some inputs in and the, the results we get out are um, really, look really different from the original package. The, the, they're all still structured. There's not if then else statements, there's not looping. Um, there may be machine processing that results in a different config, but it's all sort of traceable. And the idea is that it can be traceable all the way from the, the user intent, all the way down to those infrastructure intent. And that traceability and that declarative 
nature, Stephen referred to declarative earlier talking about mm -hmm. that Kubernetes is declarative and that we can add our resource or in infrastructure resource configurations into Kubernetes and it can declaratively uh, configure the infrastructure. We can take that, that's, that's sort of southbound looking down. We can actually take that up one more level and we can say now with configuration as data, we can declaratively uh, create the, the intent of sort of how a constellation of network functions might hook together. And we can start to apply declarative, one of the great things about declarative is it really helps you with day two operations because you can start to look at the intent. You can have an automated process that looks at the intent and looks at the actual state of the world and then does an active reconciliation. So that's all Kubernetes does. It happens to do it for containers. It happens to do it for compute storage and basic networking. We want to extend it for more networking, but then we want to extend it upwards so that we can express the intent of those different network functions and declaratively, actively reconcile downward. Okay, so a lot of abstract stuff, but uh, I hope that the message comes through um, in in that that um, 5G networks, really complex, new use cases, making things more complex, declarative management and configuration as data are proven to reduce complexity because these are the ways that Kubernetes works on the set of data that it already manages. We believe we can take these same concepts and we can apply them to network function um, provisioning and potentially beyond that, as working as an industry together. There have been existing efforts around, a lot of them around particularly the infrastructure pieces. Um, these are disjoint though, meaning that, that they're different projects, creating these, running them for their own specific use cases and uh, kind of siloed off from the, um, the bigger picture that we're talking about here. They're also incomplete, so you end up with gaps between them, at least incomplete in the sense of the, the vision we're talking about. So what we would like to propose is that um, we start a new open source initiative and um, it's really looking at this bigger vision. How do we apply declarative management um, the next, a little bit higher up the stack for network function provisioning and provisioning sort of constellations of network functions? Um, and have that render all the way down to the infrastructure um, so that we can have complete out of band. There's no human going in and making any changes. We, we deliver this declarative intent and we end up with a bunch of network functions running, talking to each other and scaling out across all the tiers. So that's all we have for you today. Um, thank you very much and um, please, my email address, Stephen's email address there, reach out to us. Uh, we mm -hmm. definitely uh, know that we can't do this alone. We're going to need um, a lot of people from across the industry to make this a reality. Thank you so much. Thank you.